Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I am happy to introduce Laura Garrett, a friend of the Institute, um, who has a special interest in astronomy and astrophysics. And uh, she will introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I have the privilege of introducing Marilena Loverde, who comes to us most recently from Columbia University, where she did her master's and her PhD. And uh, according to the Institute Bulletin, her professional interests are theoretical physics and cosmology, as well as gravitational lensing and non-Gaussian sources and signatures. So I'm not sure how much of that she's going to share with us tonight. But um, all those interests are uh, very academic, but what also impressed me is that from a leadership and an outreach perspective, Marilena is also a strong advocate for women in science. And she visits schools and colleges to encourage students, especially women, in particular to pursue graduate and uh, postgraduate uh, studies in science. She is also currently teaching mathematics at the Garden State Youth Correctional Facility. So I thought that was very impressive. <laughs> um, for us today, she's going to discuss theories of evolutionary history of the universe and how we use today's astrophysical data to understand some of the structure that we see today. Marjolaine? So, uh, thank you so much. It's a real honor to be speaking in front of this audience. Um, so I'm a member here in the astrophysics group, and my research interests are in cosmology, which uh, you may be aware has, is an area that's made dramatic progress in recent years. And um, what I hope to tell you about today is what some of the impressive things that we've learned and other ideas that I find really exciting that we might get to test in the near future with data sets. So, First, what is cosmology? Well, NASA has a definition, which I liked, which is that cosmology is the scientific study of the large-scale properties of the universe as a whole. It endeavors to use the scientific method to understand the origin, evolution, and ultimate fate of the entire universe. So this sounds like a very grand goal, and indeed it is, but using laws of physics that we know now, and um, astronomers have built telescopes and experiments to go out and test these things, we've actually learned a remarkable about, amount about the universe. So um, one of the things that we've learned is that the universe is indeed evolving. So if you ask, how can you know that the universe is evolving, that's a good question, and it's quite reasonable. If we step back and think about how we know anything from the universe, we know that because we point telescopes at the sky and look at objects that emit light and then that light travels from them, objects like the sun, through space towards us. So the sun is 150 million kilometers from Earth. So it takes light about eight minutes to make the trip from the sun to Earth. That means that when we look at the sun, we're seeing the sun not as it looks now, but as it looked eight minutes ago when the light that we received left the sun. So, um, this continues. If we look at the nearest star to us, which is called Alpha Centauri, it's so far away that it takes light four years to make this trip. If we look towards the center of the galaxy, we're seeing light that left the center of the galaxy 20, 26,000 years ago. The nearest galaxy, Andromeda, emits light that takes two and a half million years to travel to us from that. So, um, and some of the furthest galaxies that we see um, are those in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And light from these galaxies can take 12 billion years to reach us. So as we look at these things, um, we're seeing them not as they are now, but how they looked in the past. And how far in the past depends on how far away they are. We see the sun as it looked eight minutes ago, Alpha Centauri four years ago, the center of the galaxy 26,000 years ago, Andromeda two and a half million years ago, and these very far away galaxies as much as 12 billion years ago. So by looking at things that are far away, we're also looking back in time. Um, since we can look back in time, we can ask how the universe looked at earlier periods in its history. 
What's shown here is a map um, of, that's, made by, that's made by images from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, where what's shown here is a slice of the universe, and all of these points are different galaxies. Um, we're here looking out at the center. So some of these galaxies are so far away uh, that it, we're looking at them as they existed five billion years ago. And while we see some differences in these faraway galaxies and the galaxies that are near us, by and large, the universe looks remarkably similar um, to the way it looks today. There are galaxies near us, and there are galaxies back then. The farthest we can see is light, which is coming from the universe when it was uh, 13 billion years ago. And at this time, the universe looks very different. So this is a map of the temperature of the sky, as, uh, which is showing how the universe looked 13 billion years ago. It was made by the WMAP satellite, which is a, which a joint mission led partly by a team at Princeton, and launched about 10 years ago, exactly, and has really dramatically revolutionized how we understand the universe. But what this satellite has seen is that the universe at this time looks incredibly different from the way it looks today. We see these little patches of different colors are showing places that are um, different clouds of hydrogen and a little bit of helium gas and mostly dark matter. But there are no things like stars and there are no galaxies at this time. So um, by looking at the universe at these different epochs, we can study how it's evolving with time. And um, there are a couple of important things that we learned. The first thing that we've learned is that the universe is expanding, which you probably know. But um, I just want to review how we know this, because it's quite important. So again, we know everything we know, we know because we see light from objects which travels to us. If I have a hot object like a star, and I shine the light from that object through a prism, the prism will spread out the light into a spectrum, and we see a rainbow. Now, if between that hot object and us, there was some cool hydrogen gas, that hydrogen gas will absorb some of the light from the hot object, and we'll see, instead of a perfect rainbow, we'll see these black lines where absorption has occurred. And the position of these lines is characteristic of the hydrogen atom. Um, different elements have different characteristic patterns of absorption lines that allow us to identify them. Um, this shows just some examples of what the spectra of different types of stars are. So we see these same rainbows and then different patterns of black lines which correspond to absorption by different elements. And each one of these is, is characteristic of that type of star. Um, so what do we actually see? Well, when we look at light which is coming from places which are near Earth, we might see a spectrum like this example, which is hydrogen. So I have an analogy. This, the spectrum of hydrogen is something that's so familiar to us, it's like a song that we all know really well. Oh. Okay. Um, when we look at light which is coming from further galaxies, we see what looks like the hydrogen spectrum, but it's been stretched towards longer wavelengths. Okay, so we can still identify that this is the hydrogen spectrum in the same way that you still recognize Paul McCartney singing more slowly and at a lower pitch. And when we look at stuff which is significantly farther away, we see light that's stretched by a much greater amount. But nevertheless, we're still confident. Um, My apologies to Paul McCartney. Um, so uh, in, I, I like this analogy because it, in the same way that you know that that's the same song, it just sounds like it's being played more slowly and at lower pitch, but you can still identify it, we can, we can identify these atoms. So we're confident that what we're seeing is the same atomic spectra, but being stretched out. So what's happening is that the universe is expanding, and as light Light that's coming from distant objects travels through an expanding universe, and as it does that, the light is stretched along the way. And things which come from further away have spent more time traveling through this expanding universe, and their light is uh, stretched by a correspondingly um, greater amount. So 
What we mean by saying that the universe is expanding is that the distance between things like galaxies is increasing. Um, this room is not expanding. Our galaxy or other things which are held together by strong forces are not expanding. But far away objects which are not bound, um, the distance between them is increasing. And so at early times, if you wanted to communicate between these two galaxies, the time it would take to send a signal from here to here and back is shorter than the time it would take here when um, the, after more expansion has occurred. So going from early to late times, we see a, a lower density of objects, and the light that's traveling through this universe has uh, its wavelength stretched. So um, this just reiterates that point. But if I have a universe that's expanding, um, the number of galaxies I have here is the same, but the distance between them is greater. So the density is going down. Um, another thing that happens as the universe expands is that things which are moving through the universe are slowed down. So these boxes illustrate different times in expansion, and particles moving through them are move more slowly. So as the universe expands, it also becomes cooler. Which means that, that in the past, the universe was a hotter and denser place. So if we want to know what the universe was like at earlier times, then we have to ask what happens when you heat things up. So if I take a neutral gas of atoms and I heat it up, at some point it gets so hot that the electrons become unbound from the nucleons. And instead of having a neutral gas of atoms, I'll have a plasma. Um, so when this transition happens in the universe, that it goes from being so hot that you have plasma to cooler that you have atom, so cool enough that atoms can form, electrons can find atoms and form, the light released at this time, these photons that are now allowed to travel freely, is exactly the light that makes up that map of the universe a long time ago that I showed. So we have one data point from this era. As you continue to heat things up, this plasma of protons and things like helium nuclei um, become so hot that the nuclei that make up the atoms are no longer bound to each other. And instead, I have a plasma which consists of protons and free neutrons. And I also get some neutrinos and positrons. Um, by understanding nuclear physics, we can make predictions for what the relative amounts of different types of atomic nuclei will be generated in this process of converting free neutrons and protons into bound atomic nuclei. So we can see the relative amounts of hydrogen and helium and deuterium. Are, there's a trace amounts of lithium and other things which are produced at this time. But we can predict the relative amounts of these different elements and then go out and look and check whether the observations agree with predictions. As you continue to heat up matter further, then at some point it becomes so hot that the quarks that make up electrons, uh, sorry, make up protons and neutrons become unbound. And instead, you have a, uh, what's called a quark gluon plasma, three quarks. Um, but at some point, we stop knowing precisely, or we stop being confident of precisely what happens when you heat up matter. So this process continues of phases of matter changing at earlier points in the universe when things get hotter. And to describe the early universe, you have to know how physics works at high temperatures or high energies. And on the other hand, by studying the early universe, you're learning about physics at um, high temperatures and on small scales. So this, uh, just to summarize, um, there are a bunch of timelines here. What's shown up here is uh, time in numbers that we're familiar with, like seconds, minutes, and years. Here, these numbers are the size of the universe by how much has the universe expanded since this transition to today, and the corresponding change in temperature across this period. So at about a microsecond after the Big Bang, the protons and neutron quarks became bound into protons and neutrons. And the universe has expanded by a factor of 10 to the 12 since then. After a few minutes, we form 
protons and neutrons combine to form atomic nuclei. At about 400,000 years, electrons can find um, protons and uh, neutral atoms can form. And then at about 100 million years, up into a billion years, the first galaxies begin to form. And here we are today um, at 14 billion years. So um, that discussion was describing a thermal history of the universe and asking how the matter in the universe goes through different phases of being plasmas um, as the universe expands and dilutes and cools. But what about the structure in the universe? Um, so here's a real picture of the universe at 400,000 years. Um, and this picture is quite boring. It's almost completely smooth. It's different than the picture I showed you before here. And the difference is that this, the universe is incredibly smooth at this time. But if I take the fluctuations, the small changes in density from place to place, and I multiply them by a factor of 10,000, then I get something that looks like this. So this map, which shows these different color spots, is showing fluctuations in the amount of stuff, um, which are of order one part in 10,000, which are, so they're incredibly tiny. Um, nevertheless, uh, this picture of the universe at 400,000 years somehow, over long periods of time, under the attractive force of gravity, generates, we go from a universe which looks very smooth at this time to something which is clumpy and rich with structures like galaxies and clusters of galaxies at later times. So um, this is modeling how we go from a universe that looks like this to something that looks like this is complicated. Nevertheless, it's something we think we can do. Um, in a uh, rough sense. So this box is showing a simulation of taking a smooth distribution of matter with tiny fluctuations in the amount of stuff from place to place and letting gravity, which is an attractive force, collect matter into these structures, um, letting gravity amplify those fluctuations to make these structures that we see today. Um, so, um, in addition to the universe becoming cooler and more rarefied with time, it also goes from being smoother to being much clumpier. And here's a timeline of some of the important things, uh, data points in the history of structure. So as time passes, the universe goes from being smooth to clumpy. We have this picture of the universe at 400,000 years. The first stars are thought to form at about 100 million years after the Big Bang, but we've not observed anything like that. This is a picture from a simulation. The most distant galaxies we've seen live at about 500, year, 500 million years um, after the Big Bang, and these have been observed by the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and then here we are today with a much clumpier universe with a lot more structure and larger structures than existed at earlier periods of time. So the three most important things I would say you should know about the universe are that it's expanding and it's cooling and it's getting clumpier. So in the past, it was hotter and denser and smoother. So what about the structure? Um, it model, un, trying to understand how you can go from a picture like this with little clouds of hydrogen gas to getting complicated things like galaxies is, um, is a difficult problem. Nevertheless, we think that with gravity and understanding <coughs> hydrodynamics, this is a process that we can model. Um, but if I wanted to ask what things looked like at earlier and earlier times, I say that the universe was smoother at earlier times, and it was still smoother yet at even earlier times. But where did the initial fluctuations in the density come from. If the universe was perfectly smooth with no changes in density from place to place, it would, it would stay that way forever. Um, and it would be quite disappointing. The universe would expand and cool and be this empty, lonely place with no stars and no galaxies and no structure like us. Um, on the other hand, uh, 
the universe is clumpy, but it's not uh, too clumpy. If we look at distant patches of sky, we see that um, this area over here doesn't look exactly the same as what's going on over here, but they look quite similar. We think that if we lived in this, one of these galaxies over here or one of these galaxies over here, it looks like the universe would be, we would think the universe looks about the same as it does near us. So what we have is a universe that is rich with complicated structures, but also looks very uniform. If we step back, we see all of these galaxies, but the numbers of galaxies and how they're organized doesn't seem to vary too much from place to place. So how do we go, what, how do we find a mechanism that gives us structure, some structure, but not too much? A universe which is uniform, but has tiny deviations. And we, we have a theory for that. And um, it's the following. Um, the very early in the universe, there was a period of extremely rapid accelerating expansion, um, superluminally, ex superluminal expansion, which stretches a tiny patch of space to a size which is larger the, than the entire um, observed universe. And what this does is it gives one explanation for how stuff that's so far away can look quite similar. It can look quite similar because at some point in the past, it was nearby. This period is called cosmological inflation. And this is, a, this is something that happens very early in the universe. When this period of inflationary expansion ends, the energy which was driving inflation is dumped into radiation. And we begin the hot big bang. We, and we have a universe with lots of radiation that expands and dilutes and cools, just like we had before, and connects on to the rest of our thermal timeline. Now, um, there's one very fascinating thing about this, which is that this, when we're talking about inflation, stretching tiny patches of space, we're talking about things that happen on very small scales. And things on small scales are governed by the laws of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics have something called the uncertainty principle. So there are fluctuations, quantum mechanical fluctuations, in the amount of energy from place to place. Um, and these quantum fluctuations turn out to be important. Quantum fluctuations in the amount of energy can cause some patches of the universe to stop inflation and start the hot big bang earlier than other patches. So these yellow spots are where radiation are, are supposed to have stopped inflation and begun the big bang, connecting on the rest of our thermal timeline, while these parts are continuing to inflate. The places that have stopped inflating earlier have more time to expand and cool than places that stop inflation later. These yellow spots have begun the hot big bang later and have less, had less time to expand and cool than these green spots. So the result of this is that quantum fluctuations, at, at the end of inflation, quantum fluctuations leave us with a universe with small fluctuations in temperature and density from place to place that come from um, fluctuations in when inflation ended. These quantum fluctuations later will come, could be converted into things like temperature perturbations at, um, in, that we can see in the universe at later times, small variations in the density from place to place that grow under gravity into the structure we see today. So the picture of the history of structure in the universe, I think, is I think this is one of the most uh, remarkable ideas in physics, which is that everything that we see, all the galaxies and structures in the universe, were originally quantum fluctuations, which were grown during a period of inflation and converted into small fluctuations in the matter and energy density, which were then amplified by gravitational collapse and created the structures that we see 
around us. So studying structure in the universe is studying stuff over <laughs> an enormous period in time. And um, f when the universe was much smaller, much, much, much hotter and denser than it is today. Um, one of the goals of modern cosmology is to use ob observations of things that we can see, like the distribution of galaxies, to learn about both this process of gravitational collapse, but also this period of inflation. Um, and patterns, we hope, in the distribution of structure in the map of, maps of the universe on very large scales at different times will reveal something about this period of inflation. Um, but I said that the fluctuations that generate structures are quantum fluctuations, and there's some randomness to them. So when we're thinking about the types of questions that we can ask by looking at uh, maps of structure, the questions that we're restricted to ask are statistical questions. Um, so here's an example. This um, is showing one example of what structure in the universe might have looked like at the end of inflation. So these colors represent different amounts of dense uh, fluctuations in the energy, uh, the amounts of matter from place to place, which will later turn into this map of the microwave background and eventually grow um, under gravity into fluctuations in um, the distribution of galaxies on large scales. Uh, what we think, um, it's not a meaningful question to ask the theories whether you're going to get a galaxy right here or whether we'll see a hot spot in this particular location. Instead, what we expect are meaningful questions are um, things like how how large of fluctuations do I expect to see? So here's a histogram which is showing the probability of having a given size density fluctuations. So what this shows is that it's much more likely to have to be just a little bit over dense or just a little bit under dense than it is to be way out here and have a huge fluctuation, positive fluctuation in energy density or a very negative fluctuation in energy density. So this is one example of a statistical question we can ask about the initial um, fluctuations. Another example is um, what's over here. We can ask um, what is the, these fluctuations and the amount of stuff from place to place look like a pattern with spots. And what's shown here is what is the typical size of a spot. In this example, um, what this, uh, this line is almost flat, so you're equally likely to have really big spots and to have really small spots. But uh, that doesn't have to be the case. So there are two variations on what I just showed, which I'm calling the vanilla model, um, which are the red model and the blue model. In the red model, there's a really strong preference for having more big spots. And you can see that just by looking at this picture. There are more really big spots than there are in the blue model, which has more little tiny spots. So this uh, quantity about the typical spot size is, is called the power spectrum. And the, in the, we can see in the blue model, you're much more likely to have little spots. Um, so variations this extreme on how the initial um, structure looked are already excluded by current data, but slight changes to this, having a, a slightly red model um, could be permitted. And this is something that's interesting to learn about because it, it turns out that um, the sort of redness or blueness of the initial fluctuations tells you something about how the expansion rate during inflation is changing with time. So that's a, a physical question we get from looking at this um, statistic. Another variation. Um, Two more variations are shown here, which I'll call uh, skewed models and anti-skewed models. In this skewed model, the initial structure prefers to have big positive fluctuations, which is shown as more red spots here than over here. 
And this anti-skewed model has more purple spots and fewer red spots. So the purple spots are regions where structure is very rare, and the red spots are regions with lots of matter. Um, if the initial structure looks like this, um, if you saw evidence of something like this, it tells you about the type of stuff that's around during inflation, whether there's one type of stuff or one inflaton which generates all of the initial structure <coughs> or whether there are multiple inflatons which generate the initial structure. And um, changes to how the very early universe looked like this would, be, would um, show up in maps of the universe at later times. So what's shown here are simulations of how the universe at 400,000 years would look if the skewed model or the anti-skewed model is what we had. And what um, you can see, if you look closely, is um, how this, this skewed and anti-skewed model change the way that the universe looks. In particular, on top of a really big hot spot in this, the skewed model, the universe looks smoother. So there's less structure in this region on top of the large hot spot than there is in the anti-skewed model, which has more clumpiness, more structure here um, on top of the big hot spot and looks smoother on top of the big cold spot. Um, those uh, changes would persist in the distribution of dark matter and galaxies in the universe today. So these panels are also simulations of what the universe would look like if these changes, if um, we didn't live in the vanilla model but had one of these changes. You can see, so the bright spots are regions where there's lots of matter and so you would see more galaxies and in the dark spots are regions where space is quite empty. And you can see that structure looks quite different in these two models. In particular, here you see more, more, you would end up with more really massive structures than you would end up with down here. <coughs> um, so in the next few years, uh, we'll have current experiments and future experiments are going to give us fantastic maps of how the universe looked at, at 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, WMAP is continuing to take data and we'll have uh, uh, another release, I think, sometime in the summer. There are smaller experiments like the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, which a lot of people in Princeton are involved in, and the South Pole Telescope, which will um, instead look at a small patch of sky to great detail. Um, and then, of course, there's the European mission, Planck, which um, launched, I think, almost two years ago and is currently making maps of the temperature of the universe at this early time. And Planck um, will do as good of a job, essentially, as you could possibly do in mapping out the temperature of the universe at that time. There are other experiments which will measure other properties of, um, other than just the temperature, but something called the polarization of the light from this time. And with all of this, we'll have a fantastic picture of the universe at very early times. Additionally, there are a bunch of uh, galaxy surveys which are going to map out the distribution of structures near us to great detail. And together with these two um, types of data sets, we can have a much better understanding of how structure evolves through the universe, at, through different epochs in the universe. And we uh, might be lucky to see some of these signatures of inflation and get some clues to the very early universe, which, um, which would be really exciting. But nevertheless, uh, we, there's this um, program to see, uh, to map out as much of a structure as we possibly can, and that's going to be really exciting. Um, so the future is exciting. Um, I just, bef I'm going to close with a movie, but before I do, I want to thank the friends for having me, and um, I'm really glad to be at the Institute, having a chance to think about some of these things and learn from all of the experts here who have made great contributions to this field of cosmology. Um, so I'll just, sh I'll show you a movie um, which shows how much, um, not everything, but almost everything that we've mapped, zooming out from the galaxy, 
we'll see many, many other galaxies go by and out to the cosmic microwave background. This, this will take a few minutes, so. So this, um, this globe shown here is, um, that's not really out in space, but that's just showing what at, at, what's at a distance of one million light years from the sun. You can see there's almost nothing inside. There's Andromeda at about two and a half million light years. I think it's 250 million galaxies, if I remember correctly. This, um, this sphere shown here is a distance of one billion light years from, um, from the Milky Way. And these are the galaxies that were mapped by the Sloan survey. So out the very furthest things out here are quasars, which um, we're seeing when the universe is about 500 billion years old. And as you zoom out, um, as we zoom out further, what's shown, this sphere here is a picture of the microwave background or the universe, the furthest that we can see, which is the universe at about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Thanks. Thank you very so much. I spoke I really think quickly. We have some time for questions. Is this? Oh, this has been turned off. I think we have some time for questions. Um, perhaps fifteen minutes, if you have patience. Sure. Yes, sorry. Uh, I'm interested that you, you could define plasma a little bit. As a physician, plasma means something to me, but I know it means a lot different to you. Um, I, okay, what, what I meant by plasma was um, if, if I just have a gas of atoms, then I know that atoms are, um, what I meant by plasma was a situation where uh, the, all of the particles, the nucleons that make up atoms or other particles and light particles are tightly coupled in something like a fluid. So the uh, distance that light can travel before it scatters off some other particle is quite short, as opposed to um, the, yeah, as, a, as opposed to a gas, of, as opposed to a me medium which is more transparent to light. Does that answer your question? Yes. 
So a system where all the particles are tightly coupled and constantly scattering off of each other is what I meant. Yes. The analysis seems to um, take off from quantum uh, uncertainty of initio. Uh, is that taken on faith? Um, that quantum, so we have lots of good evidence that quantum mechanics is, um, is a valid theory and applies. Whether we have good reason to believe that quantum mechanics does give all of the structure, that, that, that quantum fluctuations are later responsible for giving structure, um, but that's a theory that we can test. There are some competing theories that have been shown to not be true. Just as a frame of reference, let's suppose that 99% of the biologists, scientists in, in the world today think that Darwinian theories are correct and 1% disagree. How do, what would be the similar perspectives of cosmologists about this particular view of the universe? Is it, is it um, still debated or is it uniformly um. uh, viewed? So I want to be really clear about something. Let me go back to. Um, let me go back to this timeline. So everything that's shown on this timeline from this point on is not debated um, within the community. Um, this we have we have solid pieces of evidence. We have we don't have any data points from this early, but we have data points in terms of the relative amounts of different types of elements. This image of the universe, none, none of this stuff is debated. Um, the modification to this timeline of inflation, which explains a number of problems that we have, um, occurs much earlier, which would be sometime back here. So what I've shown here is um, 10 to the minus 35 seconds, which is significantly earlier than anything else. And I would say that None of this is debated by anybody. And nobody knows exactly what happened here, but the framework of something like this is, uh, is accepted by the, I would say, a majority of the community. There are different perspectives on um, the, what I've uh, discussed today is more of a framework with something like accelerated expansion and something like quantum fluctuations. Precisely what causes that and how it happens, there are many competing theories and there are views of modifications on that that could happen. But uh, the framework, I would say, is people think that that should be true, but it's by no means established evidence in the way that all of this other stuff is on very solid ground. These are ideas that we hope to see um, some evidence for. Sorry, I don't point to people. No. A picture of the universe at 400,000 years from uh, time nine, uh, 2011. How do we find that? I'm sorry? I'd How do we get that picture of the universe at 400,000 years from our time? So, um, so you mean this 400,000 years after? It's, yeah. it's actually, so this is actually about 14 billion years from today in the past. And um, what is remarkable, so you might have noticed in that, that last animation, I, the video I showed where all the galaxies are, most of what you saw was not galaxies, but was empty space. Um, maybe not empty, there might be some dark matter or something, but the universe is sparsely populated with things like galaxies. So light, which is emitted at this time, can travel to us. And it takes a really, really long time to do so, but most of it gets to us without being interrupted by anything along the way. It doesn't bump into anything, it just keeps going because it's pretty empty. So, um, so that's how we can get a picture of the universe at that time. The, the simulation you showed um, going from a relatively smooth universe to, to the cosmic web and some structure, the simulation makes major assumptions, I believe, about the presence of dark matter, about which we know very little. Uh, we know very little about what dark matter is, but we have very good evidence that, it, that it's there. And in terms of the properties of dark matter, um, what we mean by dark matter um, uh, is something that 
doesn't interact very much with itself or with light. And that's a pretty weak requirement, and that's all really the requirement that goes into a simulation like that. Yeah, but it's allowed to have much more fluctuation than is inherent in the, uh, the background radiation. Otherwise, we would not get structure, significant, stru rapid structure development. Uh, the structure that we see in the microwave background is mostly due to dark matter at that time. The, f the fluctuations in temperature are mostly due to fluctuations in the amount of dark matter at that time. It's there, um, that I, I don't, the, the, the microwave background is mostly showing, the changes in temperature are um, about the same magnitude as the, as the relative fluctuations in the dark matter. But it measures only temperature, so it's speculation as to what causes it. Um, it measures temperature, and the temperature is telling us about gravity at that time, and the gravity is telling us about the dark matter. This is, um, this is not a disputed topic. Um, it, sorry, There's somebody who hasn't asked the question. Well, what, what do we hope that the Hadron Collider will tell us about the rhythm of formation? Um, well, if um, we hope that the Large Hadron Collider will find a dark matter candidate, and then we can check. That, so the particle physicists have reasons to believe that it's, it's quite natural in a lot of models of particle physics that extend our standard model to get particles that would be perfect dark matter candidates. And it's possible that we'll see some of these at the Large Hadron Collider, and we can check whether their properties agree with what astronomers like. Um, and that, that would be something exciting to start happening. Uh, yes? The information about the background radiation, is it temperature or also intensity? Um, that's, it's, uh, what's shown there is temperature. Yeah. Yeah. And is it black body? Right? Yes, yes. It's, um, it's the, uh, one of the most accurately measured black bodies. And the tiny, the, the big green plot I showed is supposed to be the black body spectrum, which today is at uh, about three Kelvin. But the tiny fluctuations about that are fluctuations in temperature. Yes? Uh, vanilla. Um, but the vanilla is current data, but there's, um, there is room for um, not as red of a model or as blue of a model, but there's a little bit of room to change that and because uh, which um, the Planck experiment, for example, will pin down that quite precisely. The um, skewed and anti-skewed models, the dramatic changes that I showed are certainly not allowed, but some changes like um, I, I inflated the changes that they, they, those models produce so that they're visible, but more subtle changes exactly like that are um, allowed and there are many people looking for them. Um, that's a t topic of current research. But that's the statistical end of the molecule. I'm sorry? But that's the statistical end, at least on statistics. Um, yeah, so there's statistics. Yeah, but even, even without quantum mechanics, um, we probably expect of theories to know things like how many galaxies we get, not precisely that there's one in this particular place. That's what I mean by statistical. My other question is still physical. Uh, if the universe is expanding, uh, gravity would be less of a force for the objects, and those, so why should it get lumpier? So that's a, that's a very good question. And um, if, so, the universe is expanding, and if you want to know whether this has an effect on things getting lumpier or not, you have to compare the sort of strength of the expansion, or um, what the precise comparison is, the expansion rate to the time it takes for things to collapse under gravity. And for most of the history of the universe, um, those things were comparable, and things were indeed allowed to grow under gravity. Today. Um, you have probably heard that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So we are actually today entering an inflationary phase, just like happened at the early universe, but at a much lower level. And today the expansion rate is stopping things from collapsing under gravity. So the largest structures that exist now are 
uh, as much as we will get. Uh, the growth of structure is actually slowing down and stop. In the future, it will stop. What was the, what was the size? I'm sorry, I couldn't read your charts. What was That's the size yeah, of the universe at 10 to the minus, minus 36? Um, so it's, uh, I, I didn't put that on there. Um, and I, it's something like a factor of 10 to the 30 bigger, uh, smaller than today. But what would that be in light years? Um, oh, <laughs> it's, it's tiny because um, the, the distance, so the, the right comparison is to make that, uh, the distance that light could have traveled compared to, it's, yeah, I, I don't know in light years, sorry. <laughs> but um, but the, the relative amount by is which it, it Is changed. it sub light years? Uh, yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So when, um, so I've glossed over the whole simple topic, I mean the whole complicated topic of hydrodynamics and making things like galaxies. But um, indeed, the spectrum of initial quantum fluctuations does influence the distribution of structure on large scales. On the size of galaxies, um, and smaller, other, other things, other processes are important, like um, when um, there's, some, there's, some t there's some minimum size of something like a uh, galaxy that you could have because, uh, well, for a few, so there, there is a minimum size in something that you could have, which does have to do with things like um, whether if you have a star that explodes, it uh, breaks up, blows out the gas that was being held together, and it can no longer be bound. But um, the, yeah, the, the size does show up in things like the distribution of galaxies, but probably not in the precise size of a galaxy. Um, that, that, becomes more, that, that has become more complicated. I think we have uh, to adjourn to dinner, so that we get to move down and for those of us that have enjoyed our speaker. Why don't we give her a